two, one, you're live. Hello and good evening. Welcome to this particular panel at Sci-Fi 2021 brought to you by the Observer Research Foundation. The topic of this evening's conversation is Pandora's box, encryption versus safety. Uh, in other words, privacy versus security. This is, of course, uh, become sort of the, the late motif of all conversations surrounding our digital lives, especially in, uh, in the last uh, 18 months, of course, as we've completely moved our lives online. But of course, going back uh, earlier as well, ever since uh, we've sort of been participating in the digital public sphere on social media the kind of material we're sharing our uh, our purchase our retail choices all kinds of things have become a source of uh, information and data points about us and fallen into the wrong hands uh, the right hands as well sometimes uh, could lead to surveillance and therefore the question really that we're asking today is what kind of surveillance is uh, is appropriate? Is any kind of surveillance appropriate? Um, what are the circumstances in which this can occur? And what should be the legal or regulatory frameworks under which um, either state, especially states, can carry out this kind of surveillance? So um, we have with us, uh, of course, uh, Mr. Gulshan Rai, who is uh, the Chief Cybersecurity uh, Coordinator for the Prime Minister of, uh, of India as well. Uh, we have uh, from MIT, Professor Susan Landa, who is uh, an expert on cybersecurity and pol uh, policy at Tufts uh, University School of Engineering, and uh, my colleague from Ashoka University, a Professor of Computer Science, Debayan Gupta, who's also uh, joining us. Mr. Rai, can I actually start this uh, conversation with you, uh, given that this is this is a debate that we have been seeing play out um, in uh, the Indian political sphere and in the media uh, for quite some time now, especially in the wake of the news that came out over the summer of uh, spyware, Pegasus spyware being used across um, different entities and individuals uh, without any clarity of, of who was actually gathering this data. So, of course, we'll dive right into this before we open it up to other aspects of, of surveillance, whether it's surveillance capitalism or other kinds of surveillance. But this issue of, of us being tied to our devices uh, and being almost as, as a public that's consuming material on these devices, being trying to be aware, but at the same time being lax about the kind of material we're posting, the kind of information we're releasing, and uh, not being sure of who's watching us or why. What do you make of this? Where are we today? Uh, thanks, uh, Mayadi, and I would like to express my gratitude to the uh, ORF and the Sci-Fi for inviting me to interact with the, with the audience and sharing the dice with the very enlightened uh, uh, personalities and dignitaries who are on the along with the panel. It's very, it's a very, really enjoying a pleasure. Now you have raised a very important, important issues there. Uh, if you look at it, in, when we talk about the digital era, we talk about the data. Data is everywhere, and data today is said to be the battlefield of minds and persons. There, that's what. When the, when the people are together, people are interacting together, there is a data and, and data can go up and down anywhere here and there. We don't know the route which, which, through which the data will flow in the internet are there. And therefore, the issue of the, uh, uh, I mean, privacy of information or the security of information, and I'm, of course, during the panel, we'll discuss what is more important for the more relevant here. The issue of privacy and issue of the security of information has assumed a greater importance there. We don't know from where all the data is going on and where all the data route is taking, but where all the assets which are taking the data, we don't know because it's a completely unknown kind of environment who is on the other side there. So the issue of security and privacy is becoming very important there. I would rather say that uh, for a moment, let us not talk about a Pegasus, which is a bit uh, a different political kind of a topic there uh, and different proportion there. Any app you host, you cannot access any digital services without an app. Whenever you host an app there, 
you give a permission to access the data okay we don't know what data is being taken no i mean they declare we take away all your directory we take away all your camera data we take away all your photograph we take away all sms everything they take over what is left in the mobile phone there what is left now you don't know whether the the guy who is taking the form of the entity who is taking the data and providing services what is they are doing with the data there so i mean comparing with the pegasus pegasus is also a kind of a software is a kind of a software and it it also would be taking the data i don't want to say on that but actually every app is taking the data we don't know what the data is being is going there how data they are trying to do that kind of a data so the issue of whether it's a pegasus or the issue of the taking a data that assumed the important because no we don't know from where and there is no accountability if someone some some service provider provide me services there i they take away the data from the app and so are the so many other also there how do you fix that who has stole my data who has misused the data and that's why the issues have become important to it and the issue of encryption has become important there but the encryption technically or theoretically may make make eliminate many of the stakeholder many of the player in between when i click the things and many of the player but actually it does not eliminate the pay, a player which actually this uh, de decrypts the data and if you talk about any messaging service without naming any messaging service at the messaging platform the data gets encrypted and then rolled out to some other uh, the recipient there so there also decryption is happening we don't know what they are trying to do we are only eliminating some of the uh, stakeholder but actually data is being taken by here and there and the misuse at the proper use is an important and so in the case of encryption is very very important there but encryption is not the only answer surveillance used to happen in good old days time when there was a print media or different media but the data was limited data source collection was limited abundant data was not available on the click of a thing and that's why the issue has become very very important there so many stakeholders so many players you don't know who's taking the data who is not doing the data so issue has become very very important today and it should become as we go on uh, as we move on the digital kind of a, uh, a journey which is becoming right. complex is going to become very very important so right. issue of surveillance and issue how to what to explain we can the data what kind of a framework whether it is a, a social framework or a legal framework or technical reform that is a matter of discussion i think we should discuss that kind of a discussion because if we don't discuss now it is becoming a complex more and more complex there right right um professor landa if i can bring you in uh, you know there's there's two elements to this argument or to the, to the debate rather one is of course as what mr rai said that you know everything that we do and all these apps that we use and platforms that we use when we're surrendering or signing over to, uh, and agreeing to terms and conditions that say they want to access our information our they want to use cookies they want to uh, you know access our microphones or our photographs etc that's that's one aspect of the invasion of privacy in a sense um and you could argue that that kind of invasion is taking place under survey what uh, sushana zubov called surveillance capitalism right which is you have these platforms and and e retailers who are making making uh, assumptions about your behavior and your choices that's one part of it the second part of it and when we talk about this this need to to protect our privacy is that you know states very often say that we want access to individual data and individual material in the name of national security i mean whether it was what happened in the us on capitol hill on the 6th of january for example and who was there how they got there how did they organize etc do we know do we not know can can platforms help us identify or in india's case whenever there is a quote unquote law and order problem and the first thing that law enforcement does is shut down the internet um or want to track people's online behavior these are two very separate debates but under the larger umbrella of encryption versus safety um because they both impact individual agency in a real sense so how can we reconcile and have a debate on such a contentious topic 
I mean, uh, well, how do we come to an agreement? <laughs> and how do we boil the ocean? Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and I will try to boil the ocean in two to five minutes and do my best. Um, so, so thank you very much because you've asked, what you've done is pulled apart the issue of privacy and security and also pulled apart the issue of the private sector collecting data versus the government collecting data. Uh, and in the United States, we always say, well, you know, um, it's one thing when the private sector collects data because, after all, they might charge you more for a product as they know more about you, but they can't put you in jail. But the right. government, when it collects data, can put you in jail. Um, so they're very different problems. Um, the privacy problem is a huge problem, and the whole issue of what apps are collecting and so on um, is very problematic and uh, we have the GDPR in Europe, we have the California Privacy Act, which may begin to chip away at some of the collection. Within Washington there is now uh, frustration uh, with the tech companies that wasn't there before and there may actually be legislation which could in fact change the business model. The, the testimony a couple of weeks ago about Facebook and algorithms may have that impact. Um, I want to focus for a minute, though, on what I think of as the larger, more serious, or the more serious threat, not the larger threat, but the more serious threat, which is government collection, because, of course, the government can put you in jail. And when I say that I want to focus there, I have to note that if the private sector collects data, if the private sector collects the information from my phone about where I am when I turn on my flashlight, which of course they don't need to know, um, then that information is available at the private company and collectible from by law enforcement. So it's not, you can't completely tease them apart. For a long time, um, the debate about encryption, easily since, since the time in public key encryption was developed in the, the 1970s, was phrased as an argument about privacy versus security, but it's not an argument about privacy versus security. It's really an argument about security versus security. In the United States, and this is also true of India, a lot of what we produce is intellectual property, the right. plans for right. a drug, uh, the plans for a plane, and so on. Uh, I worked for a company, Sun Microsystems, which sold servers and, and made chips, but we didn't actually make the chips. We designed the chips and we sent them to a company to fabricate them. So what we were making was an intellectual, a piece of intellectual property, not, not the chips themselves. And if you don't have encryption, you can't protect economic security, national security. You can't protect public safety because, of course, it's, it's continuous use of encryption for your communications that protects your credit cards and so on. And so when you talk about the privacy versus security debate, that's the wrong way to phrase it. The really right way to phrase it is it's economic security, public safety, national security, privacy, versus the efficiency of criminal investigations. And when we think about the efficiency of criminal investigations, and here I'm a bit at a loss because I've actually never been to India, my bad, um, but if I think about the investigations within the United States, the location data from your phones, the automated license plate readers, the metadata that phones give us um, from the apps that are being used, increasingly we're seeing that IoT devices uh, provide information about what happened inside a home and other places. All of those have made a much richer investigation field for law enforcement. Of course, they have to be trained to use such data and in the U.S., uh, the larger law enforcement, Los Angeles, New York, the FBI, have the sophistication to do that. The smaller police forces don't. That those are solvable problems. But what we're seeing is a move away from the ability to get the content of communications to getting other data instead. And so that's why I say this is really an issue of security versus security, where on one side you're looking at economic, public say economic security, national security, public safety, privacy, and on the other side I say you're looking at efficiency of criminal investigations. Right. Uh, thanks a lot for that. A lot of food for thought over there. Debayan, let me come to you with this because, I mean, you know, while we're talking about the efficiency of criminal investigations or the idea that your, your intellectual property is safeguarded or your economic choices are safeguarded, um, we, I know Mr. Wright didn't want to go down this road, but let me ask you, because 
you know, the, the point that Susan Landau made right at the beginning is that the, the government has your data, the government can put you in jail. I mean, that's really the, the sort of nub that we don't like to, to you know, wade into beyond a point because it lands us into trouble. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is when you cannot trust the state with the data that they gather about you, then what are the tools you have as an individual um, that will able that you'll be able to use to safeguard yourself? Because I mean, we're really at that space in many many places, many democracies. Well, if you can't trust the state, you have bigger problems than encryption, um, depending That's on how much true. that distrust is. So I, I, I think um, I, I'll try and situate this a little bit because you know Susan mentioned uh, ALPRs or in India as we would call it ANPRs, as well as in the UK where this is a huge problem. Right, these are those little traffic cameras, uh, basically, which are using optical character recognition to identify your number plates, and they're supposed to be doing just that. But you know, in Delhi, for example, we know they're doing a lot more than that, right? Um, as they are all over the UK, um, which is far worse actually. Um, this encryption debate is really a smaller part of this larger thing. If you can't trust the government, you can't trust the government with the location of your car. You can't trust yeah. the government with, and, and there is sort of an American way of looking at things, I suppose, which is you want to minimize trust in the government. Uh, the problem, of course, in, in, in the Indian sphere, I think, is in three places. First, a worldwide problem. Governments are not monoliths, right? They are made up of individuals, some of whom may be good, some of whom may be, uh, people keep saying a few bad apples without remembering what the rest of that sentence said, spoil the whole barrel. But anyway, um, the, uh, the, the, there's quite a few bad apples, and we've seen whistleblowers and others come forth with that. What I'm worried about in the case of India, more than just encryption, is that we are, once you open this Pandora's box, I'll just use that term since you've already used it in the title, um, you are enabling scale, you are enabling a few bad people to do many bad things. And that can be very, very dangerous unless you have very high quality oversight measures, procedures, controls, et cetera, et cetera, already in place. If we have those, so technical solutions are only a small part of it. If you have those oversight measures, if you have those uh, procedures in place already, then that can that starts building trust that starts building these other options that you can pursue then there are technological tricks that one can pull whether you're talking about sort of secret sharing based techniques or sort of some kind of escrowed stuff there's a bunch of things that one can talk about once you have that initial sort of modicum of trust hmm. the second thing i quickly wanted to mention is really an education problem Right, and I've done this. I, I I I did this out of depression, I suppose would be the right way. I called up a bunch of people and basically asked them what what they thought about their privacy and their security, and almost universally, and this is from people across classes and so called you know income levels and costs everything. Um, nobody cares. Yeah, in India absolutely nobody cares they're like get me my stuff fast i don't care what the stupid government is doing of course they don't care what the stupid government is doing until they get into trouble hmm. uh, so i think that it, it, it's a combination of those two things we need to have those procedures in place but the government is never going to do that no government is going to do that unless there's public push and there's not going to be public push until the public actually cares about this stuff Right. right. So, so I would like to actually respond a little to Debian, if I might. Sure. Go ahead. Um, in the 1970s in the United States, we had hearings in Congress that exposed the extent of the U.S. Army, uh, the FBI, the CIA, and other agencies spying on the American public involved in doing political protests of one sort or another, anti-Vietnam marches, civil rights work, even women's rights work. And out of that came restrictions, uh, recommendations on restrictions on surveillance on what was called national security as opposed to criminal activity. And during the report, which is a very famous report for the United States, 
talked about when you conduct surveillance on that type of activity, what you end up doing is chasing people out from the middle of the political spectrum. The people on, on, on the extremes will still participate, but you lose the broad middle, which is so crucial in a democracy. And so, although you said people don't care about privacy, I think, in fact, it is absolutely essential for a democracy, um, and that you can't have a functioning democracy without the ability to prevent the government doing bulk surveillance. Yeah, absolutely. And my suspicion is they care very much about privacy, except if you ask them, so they'll say otherwise. Right? <laughs> that's it, okay. I mean, no, that's my, my, I just, I just... Uh, yeah, I just... Uh, but Mr. I, before you respond, I just want to come to you with a question also, because I think the point is well taken, even though what you said earlier, that, you know, we when we're using all this technology, we're also, we want to argue willfully surrendering our rights, etc. But there is a there is a distance between the state and these private sector entities that are gathering our data, which is being bridged. I mean, we saw it here with the Aadhaar debate, for example, when you had, you know, private mobile phone companies demanding your Aadhaar details, even though they are not supposed to be asking. Today, you cannot do anything without Aadhaar, even though it's not technically ID, it's not technically mandatory in many uh, aspects of your private life, but nobody will give you a, an ear. I mean, uh, your, your vaccination booking, for example, the website where you book your vaccination asks you for any one kind of ID to block your slot. It could be a driver's license, a passport, your Aadhaar card. Um, Aadhaar, Susan, is, is the equivalent, I, I know guess. What Aadhaar is. Okay, yes. social security number, right. Um, so, you know, it asks you for any one of those. And when you take that ID, it happened with me. I, I put in my passport. When I went with my passport, they refused to register me for my vaccine without my Aadhaar. And I tried to understand why. And next thing you know that it's being linked to a universal health ID. I didn't ask for this. I didn't choose this. Who's deciding these things for me, Mr. Rai? Why is it being done without my consent? That's the real issue. I think individual agency is being chipped away at uh, in this quest for data, whether it is by the private sector or whether it is the government in cahoots with the private sector. Uh, in some instances, leave alone the national security argument. I'm, I mean, why is my why is a universal health ID mandatory for me? No, you see, my ID. Uh, uh, shall I shall I answer or shall I? Yes, say? yes, please go so, ahead. I mean, you have raised a very very important points there. See, there are two aspects. One is the conceptual principal aspect there. Mm -hmm. okay? Other is a practic practitioner aspect. The point which you said is a practitioner aspect. Okay. First of all, I must say that the SSN and other they are not identical numbers there. Right. SSN, they have, the government has said, the US government has said, this is not meant for identification. They have said very categorically, where the Aadhaar number also was not meant for identification. Okay, it was meant for authentication. Identification right. and authentication are slight to do two different aspects are there. Yeah, my all two panelists are professor, they understand well better than me. So we have practitioner point while the theoretical aspect concept was good that we want to authenticate that it's a Gulshan Rai who's getting the subsidy is getting the services there. But then now distorting the practical aspect that's a second aspect there. So first we need to look at the two aspects to there. Now if you see the comment I don't think I mean there are good point and the bad point against the comment there. The good point is that that in the Indian constitution you can file a writ. Okay, there are number of writs possible in the in the in the constitution of India. You can file a writ against the government, but you cannot file a writ against the private sector. I as an individual Gulshan Rai cannot file a writ against the private sector. It's a writ kind of a constitution. It's a concept I'm talking about it. It's a writ kind of a power which led to the evolving, uh, declaring a right to privacy, the fundamental act. Okay. Had it not been a writ there, the people filed a writ, it wouldn't have declared that the privacy is the fundamental right enshrined in Article 21 of the Constitution of India. So that is a plus point also. If tomorrow Adar was challenged, Adar was uh, Adar, certain sections were read down, certain sections were, uh, were uh, stuck out, and the government has to come with the Adar Act, 
and I am sure Aadhaar Act will be looked in a different manner. It will have a different repercussion when the privacy bill comes back, which is pending before the Parliament. There, it will have a different thing. They lay down certain criteria that any kind of a thing you got to judge within that particular index and parameter. If you look at the photos of the judgment, that Aadhaar a judgment, it is laid down certain principles there. Certain index, certain yardstick have been laid down there. Then it becomes a law of the country. So it has a concept is good that you need kind of thing. Ultimately, what uh, what Susan said, she said a very 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 I mean uh, a lighter word, security versus security. If the government is surveilling it, if the government takes a data in the name of surveillance, ultimately they are providing security. They also intend to provide a security to a citizen. Safety again. They are talking about a safety to the citizen. They are not talking about they want to misuse it. The issue comes up, and I don't think any of the citizens, any of them, will have any any issue with the collecting data provided. The issue comes up when the data is misused and data is leaked. It's a leaking and misuse of the data that creates a wrongful gain and wrongful loss to the people. It goes together. Someone, I'm if the data about me is leaked, I get a wrongful loss. Some other thing, wrongful gain also there. It's a leakage and the misuse of the data that is what is questionable. That's why I'm talking about concept there. Right, right. So, what, Mr. Rani, if I can just if I can just interrupt you very quickly to ask you this that you know uh, that this idea of misuse of the data. I mean, we don't have strong data protection laws. We don't have uh, right now even our entire rights framework under the constitution. We're seeing cases upon cases being filed in the Supreme Court, uh, writ petitions against the state. That's true. But the point is when you have a very weak institutional framework to protect privacy, then it's really it's, it's, a, it's a very murky area, isn't it? No, it's a murky area. If you say that is a weak institutional framework, then there is no solution. Hmm. Anything you do, and uh, nothing will work there. So, how do we strengthen that institutional so framework? We need, to, we need to see. We we cannot stop collection of the data. As I said, everyone is collecting the data. Right. I can throw number of example which I am aware. I think Susan must be aware, and Devan also must be aware about it. Everybody is collecting the data. But only thing that I, it becomes a problem to me when it is leaked and misuse the data against me. Okay, so for that matter, we need to put checks and balances there, and those checks and balances need to be followed and need to be observed scrupulously and strictly. Okay, now if you look at it, there we are getting this whole subject of the security privacy is becoming very very blurred and very very controversial there. So look at the privacy law. Susan mentioned about the GDPR, okay, European law mentioned about it. Look at all the privacy law, all all are not interoperable. GDPR says you, I will recognize your privacy law only only if you follow my principles there. Now you look at the, I mean, I get the news yesterday that the the US is going to announce the uh, Indian, I mean, they can travel to USA, providing. I mean, these are all the news media said. These are one, two, three. RT-PCR should be there three days before. You should have a negative COVID report there. Then you will have to provide the contact information also, so that the American agencies can contact you. Now that concept misuse can happen with the Indian and can happen with the Americans also. The issue of privacy is at par whether it is American or Indian there or any other any foreigner entering the U.S. The principle is same there. So how can you can justify this concept in the? I mean, when when it's a Indian that no, I have a right to uh, surveillance you, but I can't surveillance you on the U.S. or uh, if you are a U.S. citizen, you can't justify that kind of a thing. So I think today the issues are becoming very very complex, and in my view, you if you leave, that is where these are all universally applicable. Data is a universally flowing. The data is not something. I mean, I have been saying, uh, uh, Mayaji. I have been saying in the Parliament Committee also, if something is flowing on the internet, can you localize it? You cannot localize it. I don't know how will they localize the data about their credit in the privacy bill. So when we are talking about internet data flowing on internet in the international network, 
I think we and so it's a universal problem. Which Devi had said is universal problem. The problem there. We need to rather than every country coming with their own privacy law and coming trying to put put own sovereignty. You recognize me. I recognize you. I follow one principle. As you follow different principles there. I think we need to have a universal law. Why don't the UN takes initiative and create a universal law? It is take time, but someday we have to start. How can you justify that as an Indian I go to UK and you have to give a fingerprint? If I'm a diplomat, I travel on a diplomatic passport. Then I'm exempted for fingerprint. If you, if Maya is traveling on a on a on a, a blue passport, you have to give a fingerprint. How can you justify that you can't take a fingerprint of a, a British national and you can take a fingerprint of Indian or any other person there? It can't be justified that. So we need to have a universal law. Yeah, That's so the point you wanted to come in, I think, and I and I think this is a, this is a valid point that Mr. Rai has raised because it's also a very oft-repeated argument against maintaining privacy that you get. You know, we're going in to apply for a visa to the U.S. mission, and we have to give our biometrics. So, if the U.S. can have our biometrics, what is the problem with you giving the Indian state your biometrics? This is something we hear about often. And again, I come back to the point I asked Mr. Rai, which is that. If your institutions that protect this data and the regulatory framework that protects this data is strong and robust, uh, perhaps these concerns will be mitigated. Um, you know, I mean, how do you make? Um, no one is saying in the digital universe that surveillance is not going to happen. But how do you make it more difficult? I mean, you have to, you you have to be able to say. You know, you can do the surveillance, but it has to be done under a certain framework with certain regulations, with certain kinds of oversight, uh, and you know whether it whether it's in the nature of court monitored oversight or whatever else have you. I mean, I'll come to Susan as well, but very quickly, Devan, um, on this. Sure, I'll I'll quickly first mention what came into mind when Dr. Rai mentioned UN laws. Or, or the UN doing something. I think I'll be nice and say it's a Herculean task in the original sense of the word. The gods are against you. Um, I, I'll, I'll just mention two quick things. First, the ground level level reality, which Maya you mentioned when talking about Aadhaar cards. Sure, Aadhaar is meant to be for something, but I know every time I fly, that's what I carry, and you know that's what lets me into the airport and through security. A card which is supposed to be only for authentication. At no point is it checked against any of my biometrics, and that's what we end up using in real life, mm. right? So I, I, I think what is happening on the ground and who are the people going through this? The thing with the U.S. visa example that you mentioned, I agree philosophically, but in reality, most of the people in India applying for U.S. visas are fairly privileged people who can take care of themselves, right? Um, in Let's say with the case of recently, you may have heard social welfare workers, the Anganwadi workers in India, they were being forced essentially to use this app, mm -hmm. and that ran into its own troubles. But when 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 we start rolling out things at scale and force people of marginalized backgrounds to use that, that's when we need to be extra careful with how we are using that data, right? Of course, everyone's data matters. But it's easier to care less about the data of some people than others. Yes, and in some cases, that data was used for profiling as well. So I right. think we need to be so, mindful of that. Yeah, and and we have to be careful to, you know, this thing that Dr. Rai said about, you know, bad things happen when leaks happen. Of course, the question therefore is, how can we set up structures that minimize chances of such a leak, right? And one of the best ways to prevent such a leak is not to gather data that is not absolutely required, right? Um, once you gather data, once you put all of that in one place, link it together, make it scalable, uh, which we've been doing for things like uh, Aadhaar, for example, among others. And I, 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 I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, the government is out to be evil. I really do think, and I know many of the people who worked on these systems, they were doing it for a good reason and with the best of intentions. Right, uh, but I think there needs to be a lot more effort put into preventing misuse and creating the structures for preventing misuse before that misuse happens. Right. Okay, uh, Susan. Let me just uh, uh, throw this back at you because I mean, it's it's very nice to sit here and talk about you know 
preventing misuse or finding the ways to ensure that there isn't misuse but again once again we once again come to the elephant in the room is that who is misusing this data and what are they misusing it for because it could be you know identity theft online and my credit card information is stolen it could be amazon trying to sell me more books that they think i may be interested in uh, it could be an intelligence agency saying you know we're we're trying to keep a tab on what our political opponents might be uh, might be thinking or doing uh, it could be any number of things or any number of entities so or or in in i guess in the national interest it could be the state saying we have information that something is uh, something bad is going to happen and we are using data and we're using technology to ensure we prevent uh, a terrorist attack or a, an incident that could go awry whatever it may be so uh, who's making these judgments i mean the fact is it comes down to that right it comes down to being able to make a judgment where leaks are not happening where the data being gathered is being used for the purpose it is being gathered for uh, there is no malign intent and it doesn't become a political tool i think that's really the concern as well and how many hours do i have to answer this question <laughs> <laughs> so so let me try and answer it just try and briefly take this huge conundrum and, and answer small pieces of it first of all um i'm sure i did something illegal this morning and the only thing i've done this morning so far is made myself breakfast i'm, I'm in mourning in the united states made myself breakfast uh, first i went out and got the newspaper and the illegal thing i did was i crossed the street against the light now no there were no there was no traffic there was no policeman and if i hadn't said so nobody would know this because there were no 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 camera um and when i was speeding a few years ago and got stopped by a policeman i got a warning but that's because i was a middle-aged white woman rather than a young black man and um when we say um what does it matter if the government has it unless you know the government is doing illegal things the fact is that in many cases you have prosecutorial prosecutorial judgment as to whether or not to bring a case and we know that there are more cases amongst for against people of uh, minority people of one sort or another black and brown people in the united states so that's one piece collecting the data makes people more vulnerable because all of us do i think the average is two or three illegal things a day whether it's speeding or jaywalking or 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 whatever um uh the second thing is i'm reminded and this is uh i thought both of arogya said to uh which did not actually provide terribly useful information about uh exposure notification yeah uh but i'm reminded actually of trace together which was the first app and it came in singapore and originally it was said it was voluntary and the data would only be used and so what this app did was tell two people whether or not tell somebody if they've been exposed to someone who who turned out to have covid um and uh the way the app worked is that the ministry of health knew which to which people were in close proximity uh at the time that it was launched it was said that the the use would be voluntary and the use would be for healthcare well the information is now shared with law enforcement and it's no longer voluntary in the sense to get into office buildings to get into malls to get into government buildings you need to be using trace together what we see whether you talk about the US wiretap law or trace together or whatever is you see mission creep function creep as data is collected um and so that is uh, a particularly problematic thing you add that to the communities at risk and um there's a serious problem there Um, I'll stop here because there are lots of us and not much time left. Mr. Rai, do you want to come in on this as well? Yeah, go ahead. You see, the the solution which you ask is that the uh, to stop misuses. I mean, it has to be a data collection by the private sector or the government sector. I cannot tell how the private sector collects the data or the government collects the data. But how to the real issue is, and we if we identify how to stop misuse of the data, that's a real issue. and that i think we should focus on that in my view the i mean the uh, the one solution to start with i mean you have you would have seen the in the in this uh, current going case in the ncb in mumbai there 
one of the political power, political person has raised an issue in the court. How come the data is leaked? And in the previous, in some other cases also, the parties have raised the issue in the in in the court that how the data is leaked out. The data, whatever we gave to the authority, they leaked out there. And I think the one of the issue is the courts have to be little more vigilant and they have to they have to be more aggressive in addressing this issue. That's number one. They have to address the issue because that will one of the effective way to do that. The second is that today, unfortunately, the all those security agencies they have not been created out of the statute. They are under certain different kind of arrangement. In if you go to any other country in the democratic country, the no every every a, a ministry or every agency is. Has to be is answerable to the some parliament committee, okay, Congress committee in USA and other committee. I think here also we need to make the agents accountable to someone. Some parliament would be good. The Democratic Party, Democratic, some democratic structure. Let me say democratic structure where the people from different origin, from different political background, they should be there and they should be able to do that. That no one has guaranteed the party A will be in a power, party B cannot be in the power. It all depends upon how the elect people choose the elect electorate chooses the government there. But each one of them has a role to play in the system. So I think the, we need to enhance the accountability of the organization who's collecting the data. And what Debian said, I think that that uh, will be ensured by the data protection uh, bill, which is pending. You collect the data what you need. They are focusing on users there. So in my view, court has to be more vigilant. Court has to be more efficient and addressing the issue which a common public faces, citizen faces. They have to come to the bring a to the constitution provides there. It's a right. Article 21 give me right and court should give me the reply in the Article 21 there. Article 14, 21 they must give me reply. And second thing is that the agencies, no matter whatsoever agency is there, put them to the accountability to the democratic structure. Mm. That's what we need to look at it there. We need to stop misuse. We need to stop a, a leakage of information there. That's why we need to do that. We need to do that. I mean, collection will happen, surveillance will happen. Surveillance, as I said, is also meant for the security of the common citizen. Mm -hmm. Actually, so we need to check the misuse and leakage, which is not a proper kind of a thing. Leakage, absolutely no leakage. I share the data with you as per the law. You because you express a need, you get accountable. I get accountable there. So accountability has to be enhanced, and every institution collecting the data need to be uh, put to some democratic oversee supervision democratic structure. I think Mr. Rai has just given us a headline with that uh, that comment about how our agencies need to be uh, uh, held accountable and. No, no, my, my, I'm not talking about agencies. I'm talking about anyone who collects the data. Collects data. Anyone who collects data and, and in, but can you can Mr. Mr. Rai can you hold can you put the so it's one thing to say that state agencies that collect data should be held accountable to the democratic structures of parliament or whatever have you, whatever structure you decide. Can you do the same for the private sector? No, that's what I'm saying. No, no, no. Private sector is being taken care of by the privacy bill. Hmm. Okay. Issue with the privacy bill, some people are talking about that you allow state to, state to collect data. Adar, you said, mentioned about it there. So I think I'm not talking about agencies, Maharaji. I'm not talking about agencies. The, the state, let us be general, the principal. Yeah. The state should, should should get accountable to the democratic structure. That's all I'm saying. But exactly. But what do you mean by the state then becomes a question, right? The, if the state oh, is a, de a democracy, then the institutions of the state need to be held accountable. When I, when I say state, when I say state, when yeah. I say state, as I say, the uh, the institutions working under state is government is not a one one kind of a minister is a government. Right. Right. In it, depending upon what powers have been delegated, powers have been given, well, that's what the government, yeah. minister can be a government and yeah. the cabinet is also a government. So the institutions in the state, when we commonly say state, state should be put to answerable to democratic kind of a structure. So, Professor Landau, I mean, this is something we're seeing it happen actually on Capitol Hill right now. Last week, we had, uh, you know, testimonies by the Facebook whistleblower who was sitting in front of a congressional committee uh, and, and answering some really tough questions about what 
a you know a supranational uh, tech platform uh, is basically doing with our data uh, and you know it, it's confounding an entire country it's confounding congress it's confounding the international community no one seems to have the answer of how to deal with this so while mr rai is talking about the state being accountable to you know a, a stru structure uh, some kind of a structure of oversight the question again is can the private sector be held accountable similarly globally because what the us is doing with facebook for example falls within us jurisdiction how will that apply in other jurisdictions india can legislate how facebook and other internet companies operate within india the uk can legislate how it operates within the uk uh we saw in the united states when there wasn't a federal privacy law and states began uh passing privacy laws all of a sudden the companies had to satisfy multiple different privacy laws these were privacy breach laws rather than privacy laws but privacy breach laws and suddenly the companies came to washington and said hey we'd prefer a federal law hmm. if the companies see <coughs> excuse me action in different countries they may you know we're not going to get an international law but they they may say they may start talking to the the governments in a way that is much more conciliatory so far we haven't seen that type of movement by the governments and therefore the companies have not uh acted i think is is the way i would put it right the band do you want to come in on this because you know uh, even mr rai talked about this idea that we should when we're looking at frameworks for regulation and and protection um the jurisdiction issue becomes becomes a critical one because something that's not that's not legal in one country could well be uh you know legal in another country but i think uh, for us the question is how do we create that space for uh for the the uh, the regulation to be kind of even debated and discussed where does the private sector play a role and how do you how do you become aware of what the private sector is capable of doing with your data i think we're at that stage here and the second part of this is uh, in this quest for regulation can we keep up with technological changes because today we might regulate based on the circumstances we're in today uh, we don't know how far down the road we will be before we have regulation and where tech platforms and companies will be at that stage so i'll steal my answer from susan how many hours do i have to answer that <laughs> um no but i i i think both of those actually luckily have the same source right which is uh conversations like this happening between the private sector academics industry experts and uh, with people in the government we right. see some of those conversations happening after the indian government's push with the it intermediary rules um i am hopeful that we'll see many more of those conversations happen because i think more than any single technology it's about keeping those conversations alive mm -hmm. um and making sure that we don't see this as some kind of fight it shouldn't be that the government is this uh evil party or the activists are defending terrorism or whatever the story that is being these these sort of edge binary yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 so i think as long as we can have these conversations in good faith understanding what the other side is trying to do uh we'll find some good ways forward i think that's that's a good way to end it's what susan said about you know the, the middle yes mr rai final comment yes i to one line there only what mm -hmm. is possible let us start it we recently you have you would have read in the media you have seen that some common taxation kind of arrangement has been done yeah that's right i mean why can't we, i mean if that can be done it can be done in privacy also where there is a will there is a way and it is bound to happen because each country is trying to legislate its own stringent privacy law then some yeah. company, international company for example kind of a social media company hit it i think that we are leading towards that a common kind of a system a common law yeah kind of a, a principle so i mean we are living we are moving towards so that. we're trying to create something local and something universal at the same time but i think susan i still take away from what you said which was about 
you know, the elimination of the broad middle, finding a way to fill it up again, and maybe the, the, the answers will come from that space as well. But thank you all very much for being a part of this discussion. We have to stop. I've got many messages and we're trying not to run over time. So um, a very good evening, good morning, good day to whoever is joining us from whichever time zone you're in. Uh, it was lovely to chat with you all this evening. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.